Nous sommes très honorés d'avoir avec nous, comme Brigitte vient de le dire, Peter Singer. Est-ce que c'est la peine que je le présente J'ai l'impression que tout le monde dans la salle, la salle le connaît. For the one or two people who don't know who he is, donc philosophe et professeur de bioéthique, il enseigne en Australie et aux États-Unis. En même temps, il est titulaire de la chaire d'éthique de l'Université de, de Princeton. En 1975, bien sûr, c'est lui qui publie La Libération Animale, l'ouvrage fondateur du mouvement contemporain des droits des, des animaux. D'autres livres, Question d'éthique pratique, Une gauche darwinienne, Sauver une vie, Agir maintenant pour éradiquer la pauvreté. Les animaux ont aussi euh, des droits et l'éthique à table. Peter Singer, vous aurez l'occasion de lui poser quelques questions, soit tout de suite après son discours, soit en fin d'après-midi. Uh, and he will be speaking, I think, in English. Peter, where are you? Here he is. Big round of applause, Peter. Onto the stage, please. Peter, we're delighted to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you. How, how would Very happy to be here and have such a great crowd. It's terrific. I don't think you're going to really have much time to speak uh, with all the um, applause. How would you like to do it? Would you like um, the questions right at the end of the afternoon or some questions after your first speech? Uh, now, we'll um, see how it goes? Or? Yeah, we can see how it goes. Okay. But if I would like to leave some time for questions. I'll be uh, right here to go and uh, hand the microphone. Good. All right, let me watch the time. I'll take this off so I can ah, watch the time bon. uh, voilà. and see how we're going. Thank you. Yeah, good. Okay. So firstly, I want to begin by thanking the organizers of this uh, wonderful event, uh, L214. Um, I think it's great to be able to have the opportunity to speak to you here in Paris. I think it's an important moment for the development of animal liberation. And I will say a little bit uh, about why that is so <coughs> before in a few moments. Uh, I thought wh what I have said I would talk about is uh, the paths to animal liberation. And by that I mean the paths to implementing the ideas that I expressed in my book, Animal Liberation, uh, that was published 40 years ago this year. Uh, and uh, the way in which we can end the exploitation of animals, which uh, is continuing and, uh, in fact, in some respects is growing, but in other respects which we have made progress towards changing. <clears throat> but let me begin by talking about the, the essential ethical principles on which I think this movement is founded and which I tried to set out in that book such a long time ago. Because I think that what has to underpin the progress towards animal liberation is the idea that this is an important ethical issue. That this is one of the challenges that we face if we want to think of ourselves as a society that is living ethically and also if we want to think, think of ourselves more personally as individuals who are living ethically. When I uh, first came across the, uh, this sort of the thoughts that led to my writing the book, it was while I was a graduate student at Oxford University in 1970. And the very idea that uh, something about animals could be a really important moral issue had not occurred to me up to that point. Now, now today that may seem rather strange. How could somebody get to the age of 24, uh, especially if they're working in philosophy and indeed in ethics, and not really think about the way in which we treat animals? But that was perfectly normal then, because there was no animal movement that really challenged the way we think about animals. All there was was the more traditional animal organizations like the Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, which was mostly concerned about dogs and cats and horses. And, you know, I was certainly not cruel to dogs or cats, so what they were saying did not challenge me in any way. But I was eating meat uh, and uh, really oblivious to what was involved in that. And uh, I was certainly uh, 
oblivious to the idea that the whole attitude that we have to animals was something that was fundamentally morally wrong. <coughs> so I was challenged to think about this simply by happening to have lunch with somebody who in those days was very unusual. He was a vegetarian and he was not a vegetarian for any peculiar religious reasons. He was not a vegetarian because he thought meat would be bad for his health. He was a vegetarian because he didn't like what was implied in rearing and killing animals and putting them on his plate. And I was still, I was eating animals and I hadn't really thought even about that question. But because I was, perhaps because I was a student of philosophy, I thought this is a question that I ought to think about. And therefore I started not only to talking to him and to a couple of his friends who had similar views, but reading about this, reading about what philosophers had said about this in the past uh, and what they had said about it at that time, or perhaps rather I should say what they were not saying about it at that time. Because if you think back to 1970, most of you probably can't think back, but if you remember some uh, what you've read about that period, there was a lot of discussion about important ethical questions. The Vietnam War was going on, so there were questions about whether that war was morally just, whether you should resist the war, whether you should not accept to be drafted if you were living in a country that was fighting in Vietnam. Um, there were questions about racism uh, and uh, the black liberation movement was developing, so there were questions about human rights, there were the beginning of the women's liberation movement or the feminist movement and there were questions about women's rights. So there was a lot of debate about rights but it was all focused on humans. And even those philosophers who were writing about this, they would produce arguments about why all humans have rights, but they would never say, why don't the animals also have rights? They would never even look beyond this boundary of our own species. It was the same assumption that I had been making up to that point, that all important moral issues are about the treatment of human beings. But it's obvious if you think about it that there are beings beyond our own species that are capable of suffering and that do suffer. In fact, that we inflict suffering on in very extreme ways and in ways that are not at all necessary for our, our own survival or well-being. So you only have to start looking at this to see that there is at least a moral question here. And uh, you only have to start looking at what the philosophers had written to see that actually there is a blind spot, that they are not thinking about these issues either. And even though their arguments would often actually carry over to non-human animals, they never even mention them. So um, that's what led me to start thinking that this is an important issue that we have to think about more. And eventually, three or four years later, I wrote Animal Liberation and developed my thoughts on that. But um, this message has now, I think, to some extent, got out beyond philosophy departments uh, and has got out into the mainstream. But... Um, so, so there is a, there is a, a movement, uh, an animal movement, when we see it here and the number of people who've come today and uh, the fact that this event sold out, that there is a lot of interest in this now here in France as there has been in many other countries. But it is still not really accepted, I think, in the mainstream. So that mainstream still has the idea that, yes, we should have some concern for animals, perhaps. We shouldn't be unnecessarily cruel to them. But it still has the idea that it's all right for us to use them for our own purposes with some boundaries, some limits to what that cruelty could be. <coughs> but that, what that means is 
that we still do not have animals really as part of our central moral concern. We still think that if we want to eat them, it's okay to not only to kill them for us to eat them, but to raise them in ways that obviously are not suited to their real needs, to put them inside, to confine them in various ways, uh, to prevent them doing the things that they naturally do, like prevent the hens from scratching in the dirt, uh, to separate the cows and their calves in order to have milk for us to consume. Uh, we still have this idea that their interests don't really matter. And that's what to me seems fundamentally wrong. Uh, we have to get away from that. We have to get to the principle where we should be giving equal weight, equal consideration to their interests as to the interests or the similar interests of human beings. So if, a, if an animal suffers, if a cow or a pig or a dog or a cat suffers, that suffering doesn't matter less because it's not a member of our species. That suffering is still just as bad a thing if it is a similar amount of suffering. Which is not to say that there might not be some kinds of suffering that we experience that you can only experience if you have cognitive capacities that non-human animals don't have. But, but there are clearly important ways in which animals can suffer, not just physical pain, but as I said, the emotional suffering of separation of a mammal from her child, uh, the emotional suffering of stressful confinement and crowding and the suffering of boredom and so on, all of those things which animals clearly can feel and experience and do experience, which uh, we are not giving the proper weight to that we should be giving. So the way of, of summing up this idea, I think, is to think of the way we regard animals as akin to the way in which more than 200 years ago Europeans regarded Africans as objects that you could buy or sell, that you could trade in for your convenience, uh, for the convenience of people in the New World who wanted to produce cotton or tobacco and wanted slave labor in order to do it. And just as they had an ideology that enabled them to justify that to themselves, and of course that ideology was a form of racism, so we have an ideology that enables us to justify to ourselves the way in which we use animals. And that ideology I refer to as speciesism, to make that parallel that there's a dominant group which exploits others and has a way of thinking that justifies that to itself. So I think the, one of the foundations that underlies the path to animal liberation is to try to have more people see this, to, to make this kind of mental switch from thinking, oh yes, of course, naturally we are the dominant species on the planet and that's fine, to thinking, no, we are actually in a position of power and we have rationalized what we do, we have justified it to ourselves in a way that is not really ethically defensible and therefore the struggle for equal consideration for animals ranks alongside these other great struggles that we have been fighting against racism, against sexism, against homophobia, uh, all of these sorts of things that uh, we regard as important moral issues. This is another important moral issue alongside them. And in fact, in terms of the numbers of animals affected by it worldwide, it clearly affects more sentient beings than any other because each year we raise and kill about 65 billion animals. So almost 10 times the population of the entire planet. 
All right, if that's the uh, foundation of moving forward, let me say a little bit about how we can best do this. And it is something that we can do both on an individual level and on a political level. On an individual level, we can make the choice ourselves to stop contributing to this abuse of animals. And as long as you are still buying the products of industrial agriculture, you are giving them the only kind of approval that they really need. You are giving them your money as an incentive to continue to produce those products. So I think that's important to stop that and it's important to be an advocate for stopping that so that this idea spreads and the idea of living in a way that is cruelty free, um, following as closely as practical a vegan lifestyle, uh, that that is an important step. And I say as closely as practical because I'm, I don't hold the kind of ethic that thinks that any tiny violation of a rule it means that you've completely failed and you may as well just give up altogether and go back to eating meat. I think you have to be concerned about the consequences of what you're doing. So it's not a matter of moral purity in that sense. It's not like keeping uh, a kosher diet or something like that. It's a matter of saying, <coughs> when I can reasonably make this choice, I'm going to choose not to support these animal industries and I'm going to spread that message as much as I can. And I think this is important because, as I was saying before, this seems to be a moment when this is becoming more popular, when uh, particularly in Europe, I've noticed in traveling in Europe, uh, there are more vegan options available, there is more recognition of uh, vegan diets and of the fact that there are people who want to eat vegan. Uh, and we need to try to make this mainstream. We need to have good vegan options in every restaurant, in every supermarket, because once we make it easier for people, the movement can grow more rapidly. So I've been coming to France every few years, I guess since I was living in Oxford in the uh, early 1970s. Uh, and at first there was simply no comprehension even of the idea of being a vegetarian, I have to say. It was seemed, in, in France, coming from England, uh, it was a much stranger idea to be a vegetarian and to want vegetarian food in France than it was in England. Um, but now on this visit I can see that things are changing as they're changing in other countries where it was also very difficult. Uh, come from Germany, I was in Austria not so long ago, these countries that also had very much meat and animal centered uh, diets are now providing more vegan options. So I think this is a really important moment to push that. And that's one path to animal liberation, a personal path. But I think we also have to take a political path. We have to try to make this an important political issue so that political parties have to take a stand on it. Again, as they take a stand on the other big issues, you can't really be a political party today, for instance, without having some stand on what you think about refugees and uh, people, immigrants, asylum seekers trying to come across the Mediterranean if you're in Europe or in Australia if they're trying to come through Indonesia and land in Australia. Uh, you, political parties feel compelled to take these stands, but they still don't really feel compelled always to take a stand on the treatment of animals, on animal agriculture. And we have to make uh, enough noise to make them realize that this is a major political issue that the voters want to know before deciding how to vote. They want to know where they stand on these questions. And there are, there are different ways of doing this. In some countries, the way to do this may be to form a party specifically for the animals, as exists in the Netherlands, for instance and where they've been successful in getting three members, I think it currently is, into the, the national parliament. Um, in other countries, depending on the electoral system, that may not be very realistic. 
uh, it may be better to work through an already existing party, which might be the Greens. Ten the Greens tend to be sympathetic to animal issues. Um, if it might be for various reasons, one of the other major parties. But I think that that uh, political route is important, and we have to try to campaign for reforms in various ways. Now, some people will say, um, I've talked about the importance of personally avoiding animal products, and I've talked about political reform. Is there some kind of opposition between these two strategies? Some people will say, for example, that if you have reform of the conditions of animal, animals existing in farms, you weaken the case for going vegan because people will think, oh, the conditions are not so bad. We got a law through and now the hens which used to live in a cage this size for four hens, let's say, they live in a cage this size. So it's a bit better, isn't it? Well, it is a bit better. Um, and I think that, in fact, it is worth trying to do that because I don't think there's much real evidence that the reforms that we're getting are reducing the number of people who are avoiding animal products. On the contrary, it seems that the countries that have most progressive laws are also the countries with the largest numbers of vegetarians and vegans. But there's another factor here that's worth mentioning as well. <coughs> we want people to make choices away from animal products and towards other products. And obviously, they want to they, they need to eat, and they want to eat things that they enjoy eating. So at the moment, there is a competition. There are starting to be more and more plant-based products that can replace meat or be alternatives to meat or taste like meat in various ways. And there are traditional products, of course, like tofu that have always been around uh, that are alternatives to meat. But there is an economic component. And if the meat product is particularly cheap, as, say, chicken often is, um, that's going to be a factor with many people. Well, if we can raise the standards of animal welfare, even in ways that are not at all adequate for the standards of any decent animal ethic, we are increasing the costs of producing those products. I mean, if it wasn't going to increase the costs, that would be already the way in which those animals were looked after. It's economics that has driven producers in a competitive market to crowd more hens into a cage or more hens onto the floor of a shed or to confine pigs indoors where they need less looking after, to not give them any straw because it takes a bit of labour to replace the straw and some cost. Anything that adds to the cost of uh, production of animal products will make things will make the alternatives more competitive. Just as we ought to be adding to the costs of, let's say, uh, producing electricity by burning coal in order to make solar and wind and other renewables more competitive, so we ought to be doing what we can to add to the costs of the meat production, which incidentally is also a major contributor to climate change. And uh, that's another, another cost that we have from it. So I think that, uh, I thought you were coming to tell me my time is up. Yes, yes. Ah, right, thank you, thank you very much. That is good, my throat is getting dry. Um, so uh, we, we need to try to do both of these things. I don't think it's an either or choice at all. I think that ultimately our goal should be, for the ethical reasons that I've given you, our goal should be uh, the abolition of commercial animal raising. It's very hard for me to see how, if animals are things that are raised commercially, we are ever going to get to the point where we are really treating them ethically, really respecting their lives as they should be respected and thinking of them in the way that we should be thinking of them. But... I don't believe that we're going to get to this point any time really soon. Um, I don't have the capacity, unfortunately, to look into the future, so it's very hard to say. But um, I would say 
you would have to think it's going to be at least 20 years before we have a, main, a, a society in which is not uh, actually still consuming large quantities of animal products. Um, in fact, you know, more likely I would say it's going to be longer than that, but perhaps we ought to set a 50-year goal for when we could really be living in a society that is uh, an ethical society as far as its relations with animals are concerned. And in the meantime, I do think the suffering of the billions and tens of billions of animals each year matters. Uh, and that is something that is important. And that is something that is important. And uh, I think that we should do something to reduce that suffering here and now as far as we possibly can. So I see this as uh, an important route. And I think the changes that have happened in Europe are things that are in small ways beneficial to animals and they are things that uh, we ought to encourage and we ought to be doing both things at once, trying to reduce the size of the animal industries and trying to reduce the immediate and present and acute suffering of those animals. Okay, so I've talked about uh, an individual path to animal liberation. I've talked about a political path to animal liberation. Let me say just one more thing, and, and I've uh, already talked about the ways in which uh, animal products, or sorry, alternatives to animal products can help to move people away from uh, a diet that is supporting cruelty to animals. I think uh, encouraging the development of those products is an important thing to do. So in the United States, there are a couple of young um, animal rights uh, advocates with some business experience and background who decided to try to see what they could do to reduce the number of animal products consumed, not just on an individual level, but on a large scale. So they picked out the industrial use of eggs, okay? So in the United States, I don't know what the figures are here in France, in the United States, about 30% of all eggs are not sold as whole eggs to consumers. They are sold as products. So the eggs go into cakes and other products that use eggs. And they thought it should not be too difficult to develop a product which is plant-based which has the similar cooking qualities to eggs, that is uh, cruelty-free, that is uh, sustainable, and that will, in addition, avoid some of the health risks of eggs because there are various downsides to eggs, both in terms of cholesterol, but also in terms of uh, the spreading of salmonella, where there have been many cases of people becoming ill through eating eggs and egg products. So they set up a, a, a firm called Hampton Creek Foods, which um, is, I would say, on the edge of becoming a, a major commercial success. It's already producing uh, egg-free mayonnaise, which is being sold in uh, American supermarkets, and it is working on developing other egg products uh, and replacing that. So I think anything that enables us to find good alternatives to find new techniques which will be, as I say, cruelty-free, environmentally sustainable, healthy, and economically competitive is going to be an important step in the path to ending the exploitation of animals. So I will uh, stop talking at that point. I think that will still give us a few minutes for some questions and discussion, and I look forward to hearing that from you. Thank you. Hi, hi, Peter Singer. I'm really pleased to meet you and to have the honor of, of seeing you. Um, I'm, uh, my name is Leticia. I'm a French young graduate from a business school, and I really want to get involved in animal liberation, want to make a change. Um, and I often wonder, actually, what can we answer as European citizens or citizens of the Western world um, to Chinese or Asian people who eat more and more meat every day? 
and um, how can we really have the impact on a world base um, when when we see that actually those people are are really changing the the way um, animals are treated, and it's actually getting more and more um, like worse because they are eating um, uh, a bigger volume of animals. So do you think, for example, Hampton Creek has a chance in the uh, in Asian world? And do you think we can have an impact on a world basis um, compared to Chinese people who, who eat yeah. more and more chickens, for example? Well, I certainly, I mean, it's a very good question uh, because certainly meat consumption is rising in sharply in China and in other parts of Asia. Uh, but I think the best way in which we can help them to change is by example. Um, because even though meat consumption is rising there, on a per capita basis, we are still eating more meat here in Europe and certainly more meat in uh, North America than the Chinese are and much more than the Indians are. So uh, I think, you know, in the United States, meat consumption has just started to fall in the last five years. Uh, after rising steadily, more or less forever, uh, it started to come off the, the peak now. And I hope that will continue. Um, but I think we need to show people in Asia that it was a mistake that we went down when we started eating so much meat. And uh, we're moving away from it. And I certainly think that uh, people in China would be very ready for that. I mean, certainly you see everywhere in East Asia, you see alternatives to dairy products being sold. You know, soy milk is something that has been very widely used for a long time in Asia. Uh, and uh, I think they would be very ready to accept um, other alternatives. Uh, and they, there is a whole school of Chinese cooking which produces uh, plant-based alternatives made out of uh, seitan or gluten or tofu. Uh, so. I think that we can turn this around. I agree that it's very urgent because there are, of course, you know, 1.4 billion Chinese and uh, more than a billion Indians. So it's urgent, but I think we can do it.